The gospel for this, the Sunday of the Transfiguration, is found in Luke chapter 9, beginning with the 28th verse. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, They saw his glory in the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, and while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found all alone. And they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg that you might look at my son. He's my only child. Suddenly a spirit seized him and all at once he, sh- he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth, and it mauls him, and it will scarcely leave him alone. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. So Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise you, O Christ. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but in a way I feel like this whole thing with the transfiguration reminds me a little bit of a theatrical moment. I mean, the moment on stage where the person who's the lead of the play stands in the front front and center and the lights shine on them and they give this amazing speech. In this case, the one that gives the amazing speech is God. Jesus and three of his disciples went up on the mountain to pray and he became dazzling white in his appearance and his clothes were so bright it was as if the disciples couldn't even see him. And suddenly there were two heroes of the faith that joined him, Moses and Elijah. But they weren't there to talk about Jesus' ongoing ministry. They were there to talk to him about his departure. You know, if you think about it, transfiguration isn't really about the light, about the show, the big song and dance. It's about how those disciples were changed. How their perception of Jesus changed. This is a day in which we talk about change. As North Dakota people, we certainly pray that the recent change in temperature into the double digits above zero will be around for a while. My personal prayer is that there will be enough thawing to allow the nativity figures that have been here to be removed as they're kind of frozen. So maybe we can get that before Ash Wednesday. But changes in the air as the COVID numbers are down across the nation, as schools are busy with basketball tournaments, and some are already starting to prepare for track and other spring sports. This Sunday of Transfiguration reminds us that this was an event when the disciples first realized exactly who this Jesus was. This prophet and this great teacher was more than simply a man. When they saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration, they knew that he was something else, but they weren't quite sure. Was he an angel? Was he one of the great prophets? Well, they knew it wasn't uh, Elijah because Elijah was there too. 
Perhaps could he be, could he be the Messiah? Transfiguration is often a reminder that things aren't always what they seem to be. You can't judge a book by its cover. My confirmation class uh, knows that one of our students is fascinated by books, especially older books with the creaky leather covers. And this young man likes to look at the books and just imagine what they're all about. But yeah, this is about how do you figure out what something is? This Jesus, the son of a carpenter from the town of Nazareth, up in the hinterlands of Galilee, certainly didn't seem like he would be the Messiah. That's not how the screenwriter would have written it. But in the moment of transfiguration, the disciples saw Jesus for what he truly was. He was a savior. I recently saw an episode of one of my favorite television shows that reminds me of the transfiguration. I think I've mentioned it at least once, maybe a couple times here at church. It's called The Repair Shop. It is a place, an old, thatched, antiqued building on the grounds of a living history museum in rural England. But it's not really about the place, it's really about... The people, craftspeople from all over England and various trades that come together. And I'm not sure how the production cycle works, but they come together and then people bring these items in to be fixed. And the thing about the items is that they're not like rare items. They're not like items that you can never find anywhere. A lot of them are pretty common. But the amazing thing is that these old items, they have a deep significance. They are what... Families and communities, memories are built on, and they represent something really powerful. You go to the repair shop, you can see people. Some of the, some of the folks have been doing this for 50 or 60 years. I think one of the experts is 88 years old. But you can get the toy from your childhood re- repaired, or the stuffed animal that was given to you by your uncle before he died in the war. You got an old clock, no problem. A desk that your grandchild scratched that was given to you by your great-grandmother, we can repair that. Or a watch that just doesn't keep time anymore, we got it. During this one particular episode, a man came in with a box that was charred all over the surface, almost beyond recognition. And Will, the 20-something-year-old hipster Carpenter held tremendous respect for this item as he was examining it. The item was probably five times older than he was. It was probably something that many of us would have thrown away, but Will got deeper and he asked the man about this item. He said, Alan, what's so special about this box? He wanted to know what would have caused him to bring this dilapidated old thing in the 70-something-year-old man. Well, it seems that a few years ago that Alan had found the box in his sister's house when she had died, and the family was gathered together to clean it out and prepare it for sale. They had cleaned everything out and distributed the things that people wanted. But he went back in one more time just to check before they locked the door And he found this old wreck of a box up in the attic, back in the eaves. He opened it and found out that it was a traveling writing desk where someone could write a letter and keep their pens and their ink and their paper. It was so old that it had a place for those ink wells. But it was what he found inside that totally changed his life. You see, inside were adoption papers with his name on it. And that showed the name of his parents, the people he had always known as his parents. But the letter indicated that his parents were actually his grandparents. And the woman that he'd always known as his sister was actually his mother. The story really moved me because 
I recently lost the man that I had always known as my uncle, sort of a father figure. He taught me how to swing a hammer, how to fix things. But in reality, he was my cousin. He was in his mid-20s when he found out. That must have been an incredible revelation to him, a transfiguring event. So let's get back to this story of transfiguration. A lot of the time we tend to focus on what was happening on the mountaintop with Moses and Jesus, the disciples, and Elijah. But it, what was, it was what was happening above them that was more important, and perhaps the most important of all was what was happening within them. God was claiming Jesus as his son in this disembodied voice that came from the clouds. You know, like church things, God's voice, somebody from the side saying, Listen to me. Repent ye sinners, Lent is coming soon. But that's not what God was saying. This was an incredible experience, certainly incredible for Jesus, who probably grew up with ridicule and rumors about who his real dad was. I have a good childhood friend who faced similar childhood teasing. He recently found out a little bit more about who his real dad is or was. He did the 23 and Me, and there was a great aunt that reached out. Well, here we see God is revealing God's self to the disciples. And Jesus might have had a similar eye-opening shock as poor Alan, the man who was having the desk box repaired, except for we think that Jesus kind of knew... Jesus knew that while Joseph had protected him and cared for him as his own son, he wasn't his flesh and blood. Remember, as a preteen, Jesus went into the temple and he declared when Mary and Joseph found him after three days, well, didn't you know I'd be here with my family? The people who are studying the word since God is my dad. In the Gospel of Matthew, when his mother and siblings came to visit Jesus and listen to him preach, Jesus said, Who is my bro- mother? Who are my brothers and my sisters but every person who listens to and follows the will of God? And later, in this Gospel of Luke, Jesus pulls no punches, saying to any potential dis- disciple candidates, If anyone wants to come to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, hate his brothers and sisters. Yes, if they don't even hate their own life, they cannot be my disciple. It was going to be that hard. But luckily for Peter and James and John, they were already in. They were going to be okay. The amazing thing about the transfiguration is that God was setting the stage for all of us to come in. God was inviting us as his children, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, to join in this kingdom he was establishing. Because we are claimed by God through our relationship with Jesus, his son, we are claimed and named at the baptism, just as God called out from the clouds during Jesus' own baptism, And words that should sound very familiar to anyone who has read the Transfiguration story. God says, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The wooden box, the desk, came back to life. When Will, who, like Joseph, was a carpenter, stripped back years and years of soot, more than 50 years of dirt, and he found beautiful cherry wood beneath. He replaced the deep scratches and gouges with new veneer that he found, and he did what only an artist can do, and he made it all fit together, and it still looked like it was a 100-year-old box. He transformed that desk, and it was transfigured into the beautiful piece of craftsmanship it once had been. 
So as we begin this season of Lent in three days, we will be invited to take a look more deeply at our own lives and at the challenges and poor decisions that have worn us down and left layer upon layer of dirt, grime, sin. But as we think back to the cleansing waters of baptism and the promise of forgiveness, I pray that we also might look more deeply and see what God sees Underneath all that grime, God sees not something without worth, not something to be discarded, but God sees a beautiful vessel made new by the carpenter, serving the purpose that God has given us. I pray that you might look deeply and find your purpose during these next 40 days of searching and growth. Amen. And if you don't find what you want, I suggest you complain about it. Because that's going to be our theme for Lent, starting on Wednesday. Complaining. You like that? Yeah. Tell me if you don't. You should come this all day. <laughs>